DMEC Nightmares is a little bit of a passion project for me, and I'm talking about here complicated eyes, eyes in which you would think DMEC would be impossible, that would require a DSEC or a PK, and I'd like to share with you one such case that we encountered just within the past couple of days. This is a patient who had a FACO DMEC for cataract and Fuchs dystrophy done by some very talented good corneal specialist. But during the operation, there was a complication. There was a split in the anterior and posterior capsule. All of the nucleus was removed from the eye, but there were cortical remnants left over. There was vitreous prolapse into the anterior chamber, and the eye was left aphakic, and the DMEC component wasn't even attempted. And then the patient comes into the office two days later, and they have an acute angle closure glaucoma. The pressure is 60, and there is no anterior chamber. It is collapsed because there is a pupillary block caused by vitreous herniating up through the pupil to create a pupillary block with vitreous and a sky-high pressure. So this patient was taken up by us for surgery just three days ago, and I'd like to show you the management of this case featuring a DMAC. So this is what the eye looks like on the operating room table when we start. You may or may not be able to tell that the chamber is totally flat. The eye is rock hard. So before we can even contemplate entering the AC, we need some space. This eye is going to require a vitrectomy. And furthermore, we're going to need to put a lens in this eye. And the way that we're going to do that is with the Amar Agarwal glued IOL technique. I'm starting by making my pyridomies nasally and temporally. I'm sitting superiorly in this case. I've taken the conge down. I'm scoring these flaps with a 15 degree blade to outline where they're going to be directly 180 degrees away from each other. The instrument I use for marking here is um, the Ashfin Agarwal glued IOL marker made by Epsilon. I really like it because it's so easy to use. It gives you such a good impression of what's going on. Once I've made these scleral flaps, then it's time to put the pars plane of ports in and do a vitrectomy, okay? So I do this dry, there's no infusion, and once I have removed some of this vitreous that's prolapsing up through the pupil, then the chamber deepens a little bit, then I can make my paracentesis, then I can put iris hooks in the eye so I can dilate the pupil and see what's going on. So here we are making our paracentesis, the iris hooks are going in, I've got now a pars plana infusion running and that gives me a little bit of sort of breathing room to see what's going on. And here I am doing a vitrectomy. And I'm going to switch vantage points multiple times. First, I'm going in through a paracentesis, and I'm removing some of the vitreous from the anterior chamber. Then I'm going to switch to one of these trocars, and I'm going to remove vitreous from a posterior approach. And this is just sort of a delicate movement around to try to clear up all the vitreous that I can appreciate. Once I have the vitreous removed, then I use the same cutter to pull out the cortical remnants that are present. I'm placing a chandelier illuminator, and I like that in cases of cloudy corneas to make sure I can see well what's going on. At the base of these flaps, one millimeter from the limbus, I'm now making an incision with a 23 gauge needle. Those are my sclerostomies. That's where I'm going to externalize the haptics through. And after I've made the sclerostomies there, I'll do some additional vitrectomy through these locations because I want to make sure there's no vitreous around in the location, in the vicinity of where I'm going to pull this IOL haptic out. This is a cyclodialysis spatula. And I'm noticing here, it still seems like the chamber is a little bit shallow peripherally. I think that's peripheral anterior synechia caused by the angle closure glaucoma. So I'm using the cyclodialysis spatula to sweep things around. I'm removing vitreous to make sure that that is not a potential cause of the problem. And once I'm satisfied, now it's time to make my main wound. I'm making this wound with a three millimeter keratome, and it's not directly at 12 o'clock. It's kicked off to the side a little bit. That's an Amar Agrawal trick, and he pioneered that location for making the incision because it makes it 
easier in order to pull the leading haptic out of the eye with your left hand. So that is just a brilliant, subtle little nuance to doing this operation. I want to make sure I don't have any vitreous in the eye. So now I'm putting in a little bit of triessence and we'll do more vitrectomy to make sure that there's no vitreous in the AC. Not only because you don't want to drag the IOL through it, but if you're unfolding a DMET graft in this situation, you don't want vitreous tufts on the anterior surface of the iris, okay? So here we go, now I've got the lens and I'm injecting it into the anterior chamber. I'm wiggling it through that primary incision. Now I'm dialing it into the eye and I'm going to grab the leading haptic with these coaxial forceps through the sclerostomy and as the lens goes in, once the body, the optic of the lens is in the eye, then I feel comfortable I can pull that leading haptic out of the eye. Now I'm going to handshake the trailing haptic to myself. I've got it held with my right hand through the main wound, with my left hand through a paracentesis. I'm going to hand this off to myself and once I have it passed off, I'll move my right hand again through the sclerostomy present nasally and I'll externalize the haptic nasally. So here we go and it's externalized and now the IOL is sitting there well centered in the eye. I'm making these little scleral tunnels with a 26 gauge needle. I'm making them right up against the limbus because I want the IOL up high in the eye as opposed to hanging back deep. That's one reason that I like the glued IOL is you can position it up high and that gives you a less deep anterior chamber which is useful for DMET graft unfolding. I'm putting myostat in the anterior chamber because the lens is in, the vitrectomy is done. But the pupil is not really coming down. The pupil is larger than I would like, okay? And why? I, I don't really know, but this may be more or less a uretz zavalia syndrome. This may be a fixed dilated pupil that we're dealing with. And probably you could proceed just with the DMEC at this point, but it's going to be easier if the pupil is smaller than if it's large. And the other thing is the cosmesis of the patient will be better if they have a small pupil. And finally, I think the, the function of the eye will be better with the small pupil. You'll be less likely to have glare. So here I am just repairing the peritomy. This is with to seal glue, just to seal the scleral flaps and to seal the conjunctiva. I'll switch now to an anterior chamber maintainer and it's time to suture up the iris here. This is a curved 10-0 proline needle. And I like using the curved needle when I'm doing iris repair because I just find it more facile. It seems to be easier to sew up the iris in my hands with a curved versus a straight needle. And I'm gonna make the, a few single pass four throw pupiloplasties here in order to sew the iris up. I like to pass the needle approximately through a wound, then distally out through the cornea, then use a suture retriever to snag a loop and to bring that loop back to me and then tie the single pass four throw approximately over here by me. And the reason I like to do that, to pass the needle through a wound proximally and out through the cornea distally, is you can pull the, the needle all the way out to the very extent of the suture and then cut. And as a result, you can use the same needle multiple times to put multiple different sutures in the iris. You're not getting a new needle, a new thread for every single stitch you put inside of the eye. So we'll do this a few times to sew the iris, to sew the pupil up to a relatively small little configuration. Here's what it looks like after two stitches have been placed. I think the pupil could be a little rounder. So I'm using the vitrectomy here just to munch away a little bit to give us a more round pupil. I think that's just cosmetically a little bit better. I'm making an iridotomy down here all the way inferiorly and that's for the DMEC and it also gives us a little bit of protection here. With a glued eye wall it's often nice to have an iridotomy anyway just to um, prevent the tendency for an optic capture. So I make an additional iridotomy inferiorly. Now I'm doing my decimeterexis under air like we always do. So I have the AC maintainer going. I'm stripping with an inverted Sinsky hook. 
Okay, and now we remove all of our little remnants. I'm removing these ports, and I think this is an important thing to emphasize here. Why am I removing the ports now? The reason is, is you want a stable anterior chamber. And if you have ports in the eye, you're going to risk losing fluid out through those ports and have an unstable chamber. So I'm removing all of these ports. I'm hydrating our wounds. I'm making sure that I have a firm, pressurizable eye, and now I'm injecting the graft. This is a large graft. It's a nine millimeter. I use large grafts for all of our bull bullous keratopathy eyes, and this is an unedited demonstration of how to unfold this graft, this large graft, in a post vitrectomy eye with a glued eye well. So here we are. I'm sort of checking the orientation. It seems like the graft is upside down, so I'm depressing a paracentesis while I irrigate, and that flips the graft over. So now I'm just deepening the chamber a bit, okay, with some additional balanced salt solution. And we're going to try to see if we're right side up now. That looks right side up to me, but we're going to check the mode zero sign. Here I am through the main wound. You'll notice the eye is not collapsing. You can use the main wound. The graft is not being ejected. This is the help yourself technique invented by my dad, actually, where you check the Motsuro sign and then just poke the graft over into the angle, and you'll see it's mostly unfolded at this point. I'm going to put an air bubble under the graft just right now. And just with a few little taps on the corneal surface, you can bubble bump these little edges out. The Dirazomer technique, I think, is one of the most effective techniques for bumping out these edges in the graft. And if you have a bubble underneath the graft, I usually call that the Dirazomer bubble. But those are just some simple Dirazomer bubble, uh, uh, excuse me, some simple bubble bumps on the surface of the, the cornea. The graft is totally unfolded on top of this air bubble. And now we're just going to pressurize the anterior chamber just by instilling some extra air there to supplement this bubble in the eye. Okay, so this is going to conclude the operation. That's the end of the case. And the reason I show this video, the reason that I thought that this case was so interesting to display and so fun to perform, is that this was a really sick eye. This is an eye that's had a complicated surgery. And I think basically anybody operating on this patient really thinks, okay, you really want it to go well. The patient has just had surgery done by a great doctor. Things have not gone well. You really want a win. And in such a situation, it's tempting to sort of reflexively go back to an operation that you think is simpler or easier. It would have been so easy to do a DSEC in this eye because you're scared of having some other complication. But I hope what this video displays is that actually the easiest part of this surgery was the graft. Everything else was hard. That stuff has to be done regardless. It doesn't matter what you're doing. If you're doing a PK, you still have to get the cortical remnants out. You still have to do a vitrectomy. You still have to put an IOL in the eye. The easy part of this surgery was the DMEC. That's the part that took 45 seconds that I can show you unedited. And the key to doing the operation easily and effectively and reliably, I think is number one for me, these are eyes that do better with a glued IOL than with a Yamani IOL. The reason is, is with a glued IOL, you can put the IOL up high, right behind the iris. And I like that because then you're not operating down in a hole with a hyper deep chamber. You have a relatively normal depth chamber, which makes your unfolding maneuvers easier. Number two, to use a large diameter graft, because the large diameter grafts are easier to unfold in deep chambers. And I think sort of number three, to think about this case strategically in terms of what has to be done first, second, third. I road mapped this operation out the night before, thinking, okay, what are the steps of the operation and why to do these various things in the various positions in which they were done. So this was an interesting, fun learning case for me. And I hope it inspires you and motivates you if you're doing difficult cases yourself to try to tackle something like this.